Um, so again, let's get started. Can I make one just plug? So these are, there was one more workbook up here, and these are um, what you can order off of Amazon for the small group toolkits, if you want to look at that. Um, so if you want to, I'm happy to kind of like pass them around. There was a third item that might be already floating around. Somebody might already be looking at it that is also a little workbook. So if you see that, if you have it, feel free to pass it around. But I'll start these here. And um, Mr. Patel has some too, but he's going to be referencing them during uh -huh. the presentation. So we'll keep those up here. So starting with the workbooks, this is some material that you can purchase through Amazon or through them. I'll talk about what Screen Sanity here is in a minute. It, um, it, briefly, it's, it's a programming that a couple of women started. Um, and it's programming on how to navigate screens, and that would be video games, phones, um, anything that involves apps, um, kind of all that. And there's workbooks for um, like parents to do like a study, uh, a, a book club, um, and there's workbooks for us as a family, and there's different ages. So I didn't think they went this low, but they have a pre-K, and then an early, you know, elementary, and then middle. Um, and we're going to also talk about, hey, you know, I gave my kid too much privilege to use the phone and now I don't know how to reel it back. We're going to talk a little bit about that too. So that's what they talk about as well. But, so this is a study guide that they have. Um, then you have a guided workbook that we got. And then um, we got the middle school one, but I have an elementary one coming in today. Uh, so for me, I started filling this out. The questions that they asked that I think are um, important are how does... How does digital age look different for, for, for me and my family than it does for my kids, right? So for you all, some of the 80s kids, um, 90s were my teenage years with literally no cell phones. We had um, dial-up internet coming. I remember those free CDs you could get for two-week trials. Um, I remember like downloading historical photos and going away to go play because they're take forever to like come down the screen. I don't know if anybody remembers that. Uh, but that would have been the, around the 90s. And so how do we access and navigate that now as parents? This is new for me. So I have Amelia who's in fifth grade. She's my oldest. And I wasn't ready for this, right? So like, I need to learn with you guys so we can all learn together. But here's some of our agenda today. So we're going to talk about what screen sanity is. We have a video with discussion. It's nine minutes. Um, then we'll have, we'll have questions in between. It's really open and candid, you guys. So like, feel free to ask a question at any time. Um, and another video, which would be 20 minutes, just a little bit longer, I might pause, there's pausing points there that we can have discussions around. Um, and then we can have questions and closing remarks. So that's kind of what the day looks like. Briefly, I forgot to mention you guys, say hi to your neighbors or your tables. If you haven't introduced yourself, I don't know if you don't know everybody, uh, but just take them to get their, no their names, because you all are going to be talking to each other here in a few minutes. And while we're getting ready, I just want to also add um, a thank you to, it was actually um, Noelle Manica, so if you see her, who um, sent this along to us when she had seen it in another community. And at the same time, Mindy Stevenson was looking into these resources um, unrelated for the ECC. So this has come to us a couple different ways through the community. And just want to put that plug out there. We're really grateful when you see great resources other places. Bringing them here in-house so that we can put them back out to you is wonderful. This is a great example of how those things happen and come to fruition. So. so starting off with my family, so you know, we're the first parents to raise digital um, natives. So I did a, a lesson in middle school, used to the council's new level class uh, today. Um, it was the social institute, which is a social media platform that we use. Um, it's, sorry, it's a curriculum that we purchased to help kiddos navigate social media, fifth grade and up. But the lesson on this week was that this presidential election is the first election to have artificial intelligence. Um, so like, we're coming across all this new stuff, and like, how do we navigate this stuff? So the, that lesson was on like, how to, how to find out like, what some deep fakes are, misinformation, things like that, and what to look for. Um, so that's kind of stuff that you were, I don't know if you ever grew up with, right? Like the kids were teaching me things during that lesson, and I was like, I've never heard of that, or like, I wouldn't recognize that. So like, that was awesome. Um, but these are my three kiddos. Uh, Amelia, Fiona, and Lydia, we still have ECC still. Um, but here's a problem that I have in my family. Amelia did not get a tablet until she was 10, which is fine. It was like, I don't, you know, that's just what we did in our family, and it's minimal access to do things. But guess who wants a tablet now? <laughs> Fiona, the five year old. And then she's like, well, Fiona has one, I want one. Right? So, like, for Amelia, I could, I could wait 10 years. But the challenge for me, and I'm sure for you guys, is like, whoa, like, I gave you my oldest and not my middle and youngest one. 
I know what to do then. So like, you can talk about that too. And I am up for the suggestions. I am, you know, I know this stuff, but like, I could always use more advice or more um, info about this. Um, so today, I'm going to encourage you guys to be authentic and vulnerable and honest. And I say this with groups of students. It's open and safe space. Um, if you have anything to share, there's no judgment here. I know as a parent, I've made a ton of mistakes, so I don't, you know. Counselor me goes out the door the minute I'm like in my house. Um, so just be honest, be empathetic. Uh, we all have different uh, methods of raising our family. Just be curious. Um, there's no right way to do this. Um, we're just learning together as a community. Anything, any questions anything so far? Curiosities? Uh, so screen sanity, what is that? So it's that platform I was telling you about, programming that is free to you guys to use. Again, um, I encourage you guys to create parent work, um, parent book clubs and have like a, you know, go through this and see what, what matters to you. Um, so we're, it offers like a scaffolding approach. Anybody in here heard of the Wait Till 8 program? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so like, I've learned newer things about Wait Till 8. I think it's a good program. So the way that is, you don't, you make kind of a pledge with the, your community, parents, kids, um, and then you postpone, getting a basic phone until 8th grade. And I like that method, but I think what Screen Sanity does with Wait Till 8, it shows you how to help kids, like be in the, you would be in the, like the passenger seat of the car, helping your kid navigate this whole platform. And so by the time you get to 8th grade, you're not giving them a phone and they have no idea about how to use it appropriately, right? They're all ready to go by then. So that's what I like about Screen Sanity um, and the different needs that it has. It pairs really good with other programs. Um, like, <clears throat> Part of screen standing, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, so I'll slow down. Um, I never thought of this, but this was kind of fun. So tech progression. So some of the things that screen sanity had mentioned um, was how to get tech involved with your kids. So like starting off with like long distance walkie talkies, right? You're going to your friend's house and they can check in that way. I thought that was a really cool idea. Um, anybody heard of the Gab Watch or the Gabber Pinwheel phone? <laughs> Newer to me too. I had some info sitting out there, but it's like uh, heavily censored phone usage that you can navigate with your kiddos. Um, I think it's a good way of approaching with Amelia something that she likes to do. We've had a ton of studies, as you guys know, that stays on with the kids. Um, and so we've just come up with different ideas. And so for her, technology looked like on her snow day, she created a PowerPoint presentation on cars coming out in 2025 to present to dad, right? Because I like cars. Um, and so like, that was another way to introduce some technology to her in a safe way. So the other examples that they had uh, were ask your kid to make their old dental appointments and their own haircut appointments, uh, doctor's appointments. I mean, you're right there with them, but that gives them the responsibility on how to use some of this tech. Um, ask them how to Google search something simple. How do you kill weeds? How do you get a stain out of the couch? And you're navigating some of these things a little bit easier with them and more simple with them. Um, some other things that I have heard of were that you can have, uh, I think the right word, there's like block filters on your wireless box um, that will filter out material that your kids can't access. So like that was things that I didn't know about. So there's a ton of, a ton of stuff out there. Um, if you guys have your driver's digital ed page, um, it's just briefly, I want to talk about some of the material that you guys have in front of you. But it talks a little bit about how to ride, practice, drive with your kids when it comes to technology. Um, you can have your core values. So that pairs with the Screen Sandy Values page that you all have also. Um, so like, what's your values in your household? Um, for us, in my household, we had service, exploration, love, trust, empathy. So those are things that we value. Um, oh, and authenticity. Um, so once you find out what your value statement is, as a family, you can kind of move forward as to what you expect to get out of social media. Right, so if like, I'm on Facebook, which is archaic apparently now, right? We're told this by our kids. Um, what, am, what are my values in, in Facebook? What am I getting that's authentic from Facebook? Or honest in Facebook, like right, my family values. And then I have to also look at, hey, what is Facebook doing to me that's maybe not line up with my value. Does that make sense to you guys? Um, at your table group right now, I'm going to give you a couple minutes to maybe go through this values page and talk about with each other what you would consider values in your family and maybe how they're different from other people's. Um, so I'll give you a couple minutes to talk about that and we'll do that and then we'll get moving.
for middle schoolers um, and then um, we'll have the elementary um, hard copies available too at um, uh, this afternoon if somebody would like to look through them but um, one of the things that I think about a lot is specifically what will the devices look like as they evolve mm -hmm. um, because I know that I can manage screen time I know that I can manage I can be with you know Luke and look over his shoulder at what he might be looking at but as far as like actually giving him access this was the first time that I have really seen a list that helps me walk through start with a walkie-talkie move up to a gap watch if you want here are the differences here are the pros and the cons and of course you could search and find that information online but I just want to reiterate things like the plugged in banner and, and the um, the study guide Screen Sanity has a wealth of free resources online that can walk you through all of this, but it's the study guide and the planner that give you the worksheets and the conversation starters for like students, if you wanted to run a group with scouts, if you wanted to do something at your church or something like that, to build a more comprehensive community conversation. So there are two ways to approach it, but having the study guide to walk through was really helpful for me in thinking about how what talking points I needed and specifically what resources I needed to start having that conversation with my own kiddo. So I just wanted to kind of be clear about what the differences between those two things were um, so that you know where access can start and then how it kind of branches out into other material opportunities. So I'm going to pause for a second here now and take a seat because maybe I should show you guys the website and you can get an idea of what that would look like. Um, and all the material that they have there. So I'm going to sit for a second while I do this. My eyes are getting a little... Need a little help. Uh, okay, so let's just go to their website. There we go. 
so this is what it starts with. This is you know, like you have your about, your topics, tools, trainings, um, and get involved. So here's some of the topics that we're going to talk about here in a minute. Um, they'll be on the screen in a bigger way, but here's all the tools that they have, right? You've got your preschool plug-in player, elementary middle, you get your group study, your playbooks. Um, then there's even like a video game decision tree. Like what do you value in video games? How can you decide what games you should play? It's like there's a ton of info. I guess US Cellular uh, partners with them and they have a starter, a smarter start toolkit. There's also that smartphone toolkit um, that I'm pretty sure I printed out. Um, oh, the other thing I liked was the babysitter guy. It was awesome. I don't know if you guys picked that up, but like, what are your rules when the babysitter comes by? What are they allowed to do and what are they not allowed to do? Um, one of the things that I hadn't thought about asking is when, when my kids have played it, we ask, if we don't know the parent very well, we ask the other parent, like, normally, like, are there any weapons in the house and we're locked up or not? Just so we know, like, kind of get an idea. I think the newer thing also is to ask, hey, like, what are you going to do with social, for social media in your household? Like, what, what do the kids have access to? I think it's okay to ask that, um, because you need access to, and to find out what your kid is doing at your friend's house, right? You, kinda, you should know that, because then they might come back and you know how to handle that situation in your home, and what that would look like in your home. So they help you with that, too. They have a parent guide, um, starting points for digital health, and then the products they love. And then here's the first, this is what I have, actually. The first phone comparison is what I put out there. Um, and then on top of that, they have trainings, uh, where they have webinars. Here's that group study that you could, um, like it has a way to host it. Uh, another parent night kit, um, there's social worker CU trainings, a pediatrician program, and then request a speaker. So, ton of info on this. This is just a fraction of what you can get from, from them. Um, and there's a whole slew of videos also. So we'll talk about those videos a little bit too. The videos that we're gonna watch um, are a condensed version of these 10 videos that they have, that you have access to. And again, that's just create an account with your email. Any questions with this? There's a ton, right? I mean, like, there's just so much to go through. I haven't gotten through it, and I think it's been like weeks that I've been going through this website. Is this free? Yep, 100%. So it was founded by, screen was founded by a trio, trio, I'm sorry, I said two, nonprofit that offers tips, tools, um, and training, which is what I just showed you, um, a ton of educational resources, uh, and then, uh, you know, just talks about how to keep kids engaged. Uh, one of the things that Lucy had talked about was, you know, is there a difference between your kid being on the phone and watching a show versus them watching it on the TV? Do you all have any thoughts on that? Just like, what, what would you think? I think there is. You think there is? Um, yeah, I think there's something about, and I find this with Wes, my number one, about a small device shuts everything out, a larger device will still, but it's a little bit more personal and insular to go small. Okay. More engaging mm -hmm. Anybody else have any thoughts? Sure. Actually, kind of sometimes harder on a big smart TV because it's harder to control what's on. Like you can download YouTube and if you delete it, you can just download it right back. Mm -hmm. Whereas on a phone, you can easily control Why? what apps are on there. And That's a good point. I, never... I feel like it's a little more free on a big screen unless you're actually in the room. Right. Any, any app can get downloaded. I haven't re downloaded it. figured this out yet, yeah, but our TV in our family room, we can lock it down. So any, literally anything we do, we have to put a code in, which is really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> but the other TVs in our home don't have that. So I, I don't know what version to do it, but some TVs have that option, which is so good and bad. <laughs> yeah. When we were discussing this, Lucy and I, I appreciate the feedback also. Um, and. I found out that research actually shows there's a difference with screens and like televisions. They think televisions is more engaging as a family. So you know what your kid's watching and you can kind of talk about it. Um, and they're not honed in on that. So I was a little surprised by that too. They said that kids that aren't screening more um, in that manner are, that 
shown higher signs of like de de depression and then uh, academics was harder for them as well. Yeah, one of the things that they pointed to, and we see this not just with adolescents, but with our families in general, is that when you're on a personal device, what you're doing is creating your own personal bu bubble in your home. And so people get to curate their experience and don't have to interact with each other. And then the other thing that's happening, if you have especially somebody whose like, brain is still developing, if they see something uncomfortable, if they see something violent, if somebody sends them something mean, um, all of the, because of course also on your phone you're interacting with people, whereas on TV you're, you're probably just like watching, even if you're watching YouTube. You're processing that, even if it's not physically in a bubble, in a personal bubble. And so you're not looking to like mom to see like, what did you think of that really gory scene? And you're not looking to, you know, brother to see like, oh my gosh, can you believe that happened? You are completely isolated in the way you're walking through that experience. And there is something, and the research obviously, then it starts to get a little bit more kind of anecdotal and abstract, but there's something fundamentally different about that, right? Versus when family sits down to, to watch a show or when, you know, kiddos watching a cartoon, getting ready in the morning, it's still a shared experience. You know, it's not necessarily an academic experience, but it's something that you're encountering together. So if something weird happens on the screen, or if the kid has an emotion or something like that, other people are in it with you. Um, and so that's not to say, of course, I grew up in a time period where, you know, TV was kind of the big bad, right? Don't just, you know, sit in front of the TV after school. But um, that conversation has changed a little bit, certainly not to advocate for just putting kids in front of TV all the time, but that really there is a difference between um, when you're counting up screen time hours, you know, the time that somebody's sitting on a tablet or alone in, on a computer in their room, which is maybe not really how our kids are interacting with it anymore, versus, you know, oh, you know, so and so and their sister spent all day watching movies. You know, that is less of kind of the issue that we're seeing come up at that house. Part of that research, anybody know Daniel Tiger? <laughs> Ten years strong going to Daniel Tiger at my house. <laughs> anyway, um, it's a great educational tool, but the study was also talking about kids looking at Daniel Tiger here versus there, and they're actually learning something here and not learning something here. So I thought that was kind of interesting too that the same show, seen in two different ways, platforms. Mm -hmm resulted in different educational gains. So okay, I thought that was kind of... Too, like from physical, uh -huh. I know optometrists like love devices because they are like their new business partner. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like the myopia that's happening with all of that is like, yeah. So there's a so physical things. change that's happening. Like your eyeball moves from this to a football because it's elongating your eye. Mr. Kleino, actually, I'm glad you brought that up. Mr. <laughs> Kleino, so the Travis and Tech, um, he was telling me today that he can check He's got an iPhone. He can check his daughter's phone to see how far the phone would be from her face, and to make sure there's like a focal, like mm -hmm. focal. I don't know. I don't know the scientific method term behind it, yeah. but the eye strain it would cause. And there's like a tracker for that. That's part of his phone. The dark. It's like whoa. Like, there's so a, you can call and say, pull your phone away from your face. <laughs> so, there's, so there's a whole world of stuff that right. we all don't know, which is why I kind of wanted to do this screen sanity to bring everybody together, so we can all keep the conversation going. And say, hey, did you hear about this app? Uh, Mr. Seals is talking about another app that looks like a calculator on a kid's phone, but it holds a bunch of stuff that a kid may not, you might not want the kid to see, and you just think it's a calculator app. I'm like, okay, like, I've got it coming, man. <laughs> like, I need to keep up with this stuff. Um, so that's briefly about what screen sanity is, as you guys have known with the topic. So, here's the topics they talk about in their website. It's digital health, social media, smartphones, screen time, pornography, and video games. Now, pornography is one of those ones that we're not going to talk a lot about that here today. But it's a thing, you guys. Um, it's it's big. I'm not, you know, I think it's, it's specific in certain goals. And you mean, um, I'm trying to think of the word. It's it's specific in like depends on the age. And there's so much to talk about here that I think it needs to be like detailed. You can have a conversation with us if you'd like to. Um, and with your kids, it's, a, it's an awkward topic, but it needs to be talked about. So that's part of their platform, too, um, because it, it can be very damaging, and there's a ton of stuff out there that's easily accessible. Yeah, I think we lift that one up because it also requires an additional set of skills and kind of conversations with you and your student that obviously are not housed on the Screen Sanity platform. Once you start having a conversation about access to um, things, inappropriate sites online, you also want to make sure that you're having conversations with your kids about um, bodies and sex and relationships and all of those pieces. And obviously that is not something that happens on Screen Sanity. And so those are pieces that, you know, there are health conversations at school 
about um, bodies and things like that. But on the other end of this, uh, you know, our due diligence as a community is what sort of conversation is happening at home around your values and around relationships and um, uh, sexuality and pieces like that to undergird the additional conversation about inappropriate sex online. So we look that up because all of these other pieces are things, with the exception maybe of video games, that come up at school um, pretty regularly. And then certainly pornography is one that has an additional set of skills and nuances that we're happy to support, but um, we don't have the same sort of forums on. And in the video, Ben's we're watching 20 minute video, they'll talk a little bit about that. So I'm gonna get moving on that, just to make sure we have enough time. Um, so I showed you the, the tools, so I'm gonna kind of breeze past this. There's way more than what's on the screen here. Um, community efforts. So this is something I've been talking about the whole time. Uh, Parent pledges to delay phones in social media. I've seen it here as well when you have a friends group who's committed to like not having cell phones or smartphones. Um, it's pretty solid. I mean, again, no judgment on my end. I, you know, because I know the sports and things like that and activities and you need to get a hold of your kid. Um, so that's what we're kind of talking about this. Um, digital curfews. At our house, we have a, um, a charging station. Granted, Molly knows it. We don't charge all the time on that, but we're getting better about it. It's by the TV. I'm hoping as a kid, the kids' tablets are all there. How about that? Right? So, like, coming up with ideas of how to keep the phone maybe out of the, out of the uh, room at night. Uh, one of the things I read was that um, some of the worst decisions come in the middle of the night when you have access to your phone. And that's for kids and adults. So I thought that makes sense. I just didn't think about it. Um, so maybe keeping it outside of it. Anybody else have any suggestions on what to do with that in your household? Like, do you have anything that you do that works? I have a question. Has any parent um, at a certain grade level here heard of the class having a pledge or a commitment? Has a certain grade done that before? I'll, I'll address that, um, and you guys remind me if I remember them, but we have eighth graders, and wait till eight, there was a big push at St. Paul's when our kids were in like kindergarten on um, wait till eight, and um, we I don't remember that we like signed the pledge, but I remember we were educated on it, um, and I feel like our class, for the most part, didn't get phones until eighth grade. There were maybe a couple that had them in sixth and seventh grade, but most of them got them the summer after seventh grade. And that is most of them, that's not all of them. Um, and I, I my, my reaction to that or experience with that has been really positive. Um, because it was easy to manage because it wasn't a widespread thing. Um, and I hope that my fifth grader has that same experience, which makes me think we should, you know, band together on that. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember that we signed anything per se, but I remember being educated on it. And I remember everyone was like, we had this conversation in my house a hundred times. Well, everybody has a phone. Well, who's everybody? And then he could name one person. And I was like, that's not everybody. And I can reach out to everybody's mom and find out if that's true or not. And that shuts it down pretty quick. Was that, was that parent led? <laughs> It was from from my house. House. Yeah, St. Paul started kind of pushing the what we actually signed it. What happens is after ten people sign it, it actually you get a thing that says there's at least ten people in your class that have signed it. We never got that, but no one got not no one, but most people didn't get phones for their kids until I think this summer. There is um, definitely strength in numbers. Like, yeah, I mean it made a huge difference. Is, and even if there was a group that did get them, there was a group that didn't. And it was like, I know Benjamin doesn't have one. Right. Yeah. You're gonna wait. Life is hard for you, isn't it? <laughs> I'll be honest, like, my eighth grader got to the point where he was like, I mean, he knew that's what was happening. We told him we signed it, and he didn't ask for it. I mean, did he want it? Yes. <laughs> but he didn't ask for it because he just knew that was what was gonna happen. And so, I mean, he did the, everyone has phones which we all knew everyone did it, but it became not a big deal. I mean, it really wasn't that hard to wait. In the fourth grade class, that it was pre-COVID, but one of the parents took it upon themselves to host something, yeah, and a lot of people showed up, and it was just an educational thing. I don't think there was any signing, there was nothing, but they have several older children, this was their baby, and just took it upon themselves to host something and say, this is the experience we had, and this is how it benefited our older three. Yeah. I think there was a hand in the back. I know, I was just going to say, Andrew and Walla and I have had numerous conversations about getting with Andrew on 
how do we want to implement something like this, more that a little more structured for families. Um, and so I definitely want to submit a big picture behind it for for free class, the 2028 class, and encourage people. Um, I know uh, Andrea's husband is more than happy to dive into detail about how you know this affects children from mental health, social, emotional, and things like that. And we all have our anecdotal firsthand experiences with positive and negatives. But uh, you know, that's something I raise my hand to say, hey, I'm happy to help, you know, this mission. Yeah. But we've had this conversation. Yeah, and I think that's a great point. What I would point back to is kind of the community-led piece of it, because one of the things that is also really essential, the truth is, um, to have a cell phone really is not a thing that the school will ever dictate, right? Because it is true also, as we'll see through this, that there are times, there are absolutely students that sometimes because of travel, because of maybe um, family dynamics and different households, they do get cell phones early or need cell phones early or need a way. We have lots of students that might not get a phone until eighth grade, but sometimes have an Apple Watch in fifth grade which offers a lot of the same usability, right? And so one of the things that I think is really essential is an opportunity, like we said, to um, create that parent conversation, that strength in numbers, so that number one, you can't point back and say, well, I know not everybody has a phone because we had a conversation about this. And number two, it begins to build those relationships that are so essential when something, not, not if, but when something happens and technology is used in a way that hurts people, we already have the relationships to reach out and say, hey, I saw this text, or hey, so-and-so sent this really late at night. I don't know if you know, you know, so, so that that kind of um, relationship is there. But I mean, I want to be, um, uh, um, I guess, really like clear and transparent in the support to start those conversations, but then also where the ownership ends up, because ultimately those phones live at home with kiddos, um, and then hopefully in their backpacks when they're at school. So. And I think important to add to that, to your point of it really should be about <coughs> devices mm -hmm. because iPads mm -hmm. are the exact same thing, mm -hmm. you know, and I think where it used to be a wait for the phone, I think it now needs to be more of a community conversation about just devices <coughs> in general and what we're allowing or not allowing in our sure. when we're entering the Sure. And that's why it's in lockstep so much with our, um, uh, social emotional learning programs because it is an extension of empathy kindness all of those life skills how are we using all of the technology the way that we're connected to take care of each other instead of causing harm right which is another thing that's really focuses on so something else i wanted to add just to what you were saying is um, the american academy of pediatrics has a family plan and so you can download it and it is a device thing. So it's like something that you would review with your child and it says, it, gets, it says boundaries for bedroom, it's not for room, like really private space versus open space. And it's really just like a whole device family plan and you go through it and you set, you know, time limits and, you know, not at the table, like however you want to set it up, but you, it gives you the different um, outline of the different categories, but then you set the boundaries as far as like timelines and where and when, and then, you do that with your child and then they can sign in. So that is a that is a tool that's free online too. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I, I think an extension too then is how do we help our kids communicate then? Because you know, um, that's important and a lot of homes don't have I don't know what the answer is, like if most people have a home phone. Um, as they get into middle school, how do they how do they reach out to their friends? How do they connect with their friends? I, I am pretty anti device, but I do want my child to learn how to communicate and socialize. And so I'd love to hear if there are parents of older children that have found workarounds for that. Well, and I don't want to imply, Molly, that you're a plant, but that is a great setup for what the next <laughs> what the next conversation will be. Because the thing that I was just going to name, um, and I do want to make sure that we can see the next video because it's so essential for helping us understand how different a hard experience is for a, I think a 12 year old now that versus you know a 12 year old 20 years ago. I just it really kind of blew my mind when I watched it, and I think it's really important. But one thing I'll name is that this is the other thing that we see with device at school it's not just about being you know unkind or doing something you know inappropriate online but also losing an ability to manage social relationships mm -hmm. and so a student and you probably have all experienced this rather than when you know all of her and I get in a fight in social studies
studies, I'm on my phone texting a parent like, oh, and Kurt just said this at social studies, which is of course okay. Like that, of course that is okay, but also completely removes the opportunity to navigate in, during the day with that student, like how to manage that. So the next conversation, the next lunch and learn is actually using Rosalind Wine, Wiseman's skills about conflict resolution from Queen Bees and Wannabes um, and Masterminds and Wingmen um, to help students navigate those pieces. Um, Perfect. Yeah, sorry. Uh, just randomly, a parent that it stuck out to me told me that when they gave their kid a smartphone, it's like the kid said something along the lines of, it's like you gave me a supercar and you won't let me drive it out of the parking lot. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a really good analogy in a sense of like, yeah, they have so much at their hands. Mm -hmm. And you just have to help them navigate all that info. And I thought that just really stuck out to me. I'm like, yeah, you're right. Like, how do we do this? That's part of what this is going to um, help us with. As he's queuing that up, I am really going to stop talking after this. But one more thing I would add to think about when we talk about community needs, a thing that comes up a ton as kids get older, it seems really easy to take devices out. out devices out of bedrooms, but a thing that um, parents start navigating as kids get older is access to um, music as they're going to sleep. If your kid likes to listen to audiobooks or podcasts or needs a sound machine, this comes up all the time on trips for us because we do not let students take cell phones on anchor trips, but my kid needs to go to sleep with a sound machine on or my kid really needs music to quell anxiety or whatever the thing is. And that that is true. That is absolutely a mechanism that people use to help them sleep. So things like CD players, old Walkman, an old iPod that's loaded up with music and things like that. These are things to think about. Don't throw away your old technology because it comes in handy if you're trying to move devices um, that access Wi-Fi out of your kid's room. So, anyway. Yeah, uh, so really quickly, because I want to get moving on these videos. This is awesome that we had this great discussion. This is the study guide that they had. There's six main videos, then and now, start with yourself, which is the sheet that you all should have as well. Um, tables and bedtimes, accountability, ride, practice, drive, time well spent, and then 7 through 10, because 7 through 10 just dive really deep into that. Um, so that's what they have in their study guide. But I'm going to move on to this video, because I can't wait to hear what you guys think about this, because it kind of blew my mind. Um, this is the then and now one. So the videos I'll be showing you today, the 20 minute one is condensing all that into kind of one um, from all the 10 videos. Um, so let's get. Now, if anybody knew me, even remotely well, I'm horrible at technology, so I have no idea how to put a video into this, so I have to go to my videos. Welcome. We want to start out by saying we love technology. different today as a result of these beautiful magical screens we have access to all the time. In fact, most families would agree that our kids are living in what feels like a pretty different world than the one that we grew up in. <laughs> Truth is, the problems that happened to us back in the days are happening to our kids today too. They still aren't making a baseball team and they aren't getting invited to the dances, probably not getting accepted to the same colleges, they had all their dreams set on. The way we dealt with these failed experiences is pretty different from how kids are dealing with them today. So what's the difference? Well, to answer that question, I need to take you back, back in time, to the 80s. Good old 80s. Long before the smartphone and a time when I was in school, and I tried out for dreams. It was a dream. I always wanted to be a drill teamer. I'm wearing this cool outfit. It's going to be fantastic. Absolutely, though, never took a day a day of my life. <laughs> I don't know why I thought it would be a good idea. I thought it would be stellar. <laughs> so I went to the first tryout. I got my cassette tape, and I took it home, put it in my jam box, and then I practiced. I mean, I practiced that. I'm telling you, I'm not good at it. And then the day of the tryout came, and I whipped it real good. I mean, I did so awesome. I was totally proud of myself. After the audition, the judge was like, thank 
you ladies. The results will be posted soon. And I confidently strutted my stuff out of there. The next day, the results were posted, and we all went running to the big window. We were looking to see if we made it. And I stood there looking for my name, and looking for my name, I wasn't there. My dreams are crushed. So I just remember my name's not on the list, and then everything goes into slow motion. Like everybody's like, yay! It's at that point that I just try to get out of there as fast as I could. I jump into my mom's car. Mom is immediately like, did you? Like, don't talk to me. I'll talk to you right now. Turn my face against the cold window. Just begin the lament. Because the giant disappointment, the shame, the despair, it's all too much. Not making drill team, it may seem small to you, but are you getting it? This was bad. It was really, really bad. And this is an identity breaker for this girl. So I get home, and I run up to my room, and I get up there and I did what every girl my age did. I went, I turned on my favorite LP. I lit about 7,000 candles, and then I ran into my parents' room because that's where the one thing on this floor was. I grabbed it, and I horked it all the way into my room. It had like a 70-foot cord, and then I just started calling. And I sat on this thing and I talked for like a long, long time. We went through it all that night. It was like the stages of grief through the phone calls. We started with denial. Like, I hated that sponsor. And I was like, she orchestrated it to cut me. And then we like go through the bargaining. And if only I would have done this, then I totally would have made it. And then we go through the sadness and the grief and the, I mean, we just keep going and going and going. And then like five hours later, people are trying to offer me food and I'm not getting off the phone because I've got to process. We're like trying to work through all of the emotional turmoil and just one at a time it's coming out. We're emptying it and it's just squeezing right out till there's actually no more to come. And I hung up the phone and I finally fell asleep to wake up to the next day something new, a new possibility for a new me because there was no more emotion left in me. I was emptied, I was done, and I was ready to see what would happen next. So here's what happens today. Same thing, they don't have a cassette. They actually have their music on this thing. They've got their music, they're dancing, they're trying out, they post the results. And this time, when everyone is looking for their name, someone pulls out their phone and starts live streaming. Mm -hmm. So today's Brenda is actually getting caught on live stream. And that embarrassing experience, the despair, the disappointment, and the shame of not being on that list is captured live. And people are now watching who made it and who didn't. And everyone watching knows that I didn't make it. As I jump into the car this time, there's my mom, distracted. I don't want to talk to her anyway. So then I just get on my own phone and I start texting. I can't believe I didn't make it. It's the most depressing thing ever. And I wait. And then I get back. Big poop emoji. <sighs> get home and I immediately go to my room, throw myself on the bed and I just start scrolling. And I'm texting, why didn't I make it? This is terrible. No one's responding. Maybe I get one sentence back. Someone else gives me like a thumbs down. And then I get this thing that says, you never should have made it. You were actually horrible. KYS, kill yourself. Kids do this today. I know that it seems extreme, but it's truly happening. Remember in the olden days, we'd say nasty things like F you? Well, this is the new F you today for this generation. KYS. What do you do with that? The emotions are still in me, and I actually have nowhere to take them. So I tried to find my best friend and pulled up my geolocator and like 
17 of them are over at the ice cream place celebrating. And none of them have invited me because I didn't make it. And so then I'm trying to find something funny on Snapchat and instead, as I start to go through, I notice that all the pics of my friends celebrating are up. Now that I begin to see that live feed from earlier showing up and the comments from the people, this is devastating. Who, who do I talk to? Where do I go? What do I do with this? I probably had a parent. Maybe she came in and tried to engage. But I don't really do a ton of emotional stuff with parents at that age and stage. So we kind of lock it off and then it's trapped, which creates a real problem for our kids. They're not learning to self-regulate. They're not talking. We don't know how to emotionally process anything. Teens don't know how to do it. What do you all think? It's pretty shocking, right? I don't think I thought of it in that way, in that depth, until I saw this video. And it scares me, honestly, to be honest with you. I have three girls, it scares me. To me, boys, the same thing can happen. But, you know, something I think about is I just lost my kids through adolescence. If I can do that in a healthy way, I, I think they'll be fine. I know they'll be fine, right? But like stuff like this, I'm like, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? Like, I have children, I'm just thinking yeah. about this. It's hard. Yeah, and the thing I love about the video, but also want to be careful about, I think it's easy to see that video and place a lot of blame on the parent, right? But notice what they said at the end, right? It is normal for 12 and 13 year olds experiencing big emotions not to process those with parents. That is normal. The breakdown in this video, although we could argue, okay, the parent maybe at carpool could have been more engaged, but this, this video is not an indictment on modern parenting. What it's pointing to is something changing fundamentally about the way students are interacting with each other and how hard that makes it to process these normal 13-year-old experiences. Right? And so what do we do, you know, and obviously there are lots of tools like preemptively, you know, not having the screen in the room, things like that, but what are other pieces that we're able to do as a community to help soften that blow a little bit, to think about, you know, beyond just technology, inclusion pieces and things like that to, um, again, soften those experiences and, and also how do we um, navigate helping our kids stay connected with each other through ways that aren't exclusively through technology. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, what is, yeah. Uh, I wanted to put a plug in for a book that I am listening to an audiobook. It was referenced in the webinar <coughs> that you guys put on in, I think, December, called Growing Up in Public by Deborah Heitner. It's a really, really, really good book. It talks about all of this, talks about um, some of the things like pornography or photos that kids might take. One of the points that she made in that chapter was about how in the old days when you took a photo that in theory you might want to give to somebody that's a little bit crazy or worse like there were a lot of steps to doing that you had to finish the film roll you had to take it to the shop you had to hope they didn't give you weird looks when you went to pick up the photo <laughs> and then you had to actually take the step to do it and when kids at this age are so impulsive, like the digital access that they have removes all that chance to make a different decision. And that's a big part of like what some of the stuff that we're seeing here. But it's a really, really good book, Growing Up in Public. You should definitely read it if you're interested in these topics. Any other thoughts? Yeah? I was going to add, it was probably shocking for people to see that, you know, KY asked to that. And I can personally attest to it a friend in my life who has a 15 year old, there's like three instances, and he has sent me the text that say that, and I, like, this is not my child, and I am like, just on fire. Like, yeah. let me go to that school, let me go talk to that parent. Like, this is so damaging to his psyche and his soul. And thank goodness he's not alone in the moment that he got that text, that his dad was right there, his fault came in, he could intervene. But what if, you yeah. know? So, yeah. so technology is not going away, right? There's, I know this makes it seem hard, but there's some awesome things you can do with that. And so it's like, you know, just eliminating tech, I think, is hard as a parent and even as a school. Um, and so it's like how to navigate some of that stuff uh, because it's not going away appropriately. And 
you know, create the less, least amount of damage, and also having your kid not be the kid that's, you know, doing that also, you know, sending that text and understanding the depth of it all and power. I'm not sure if I can describe this quite right, but I'm going to try. I feel like, well, first of all, that happened to me in high school. I didn't listen to real school, but I had that same thing. I wanted to be able to sign My name's not on it. Um, and I remember my friends were like, let's go out, right? And we did something. Um, and I, I can think of a specific instance where a kiddo had like a, a bad experience. Something happened and it was kind of uncomfortable. And I remember a group of parents kind of pulled together the group of boys and said, we're all going out on Saturday. Because the longer there's a gap between that weird situation and socializing with that group again, I feel like it allows for things to simmer. Mm -hmm. So I feel like as a parent community, we can be like, oh no, um, I'm gonna pick on my kid. But like, Benjamin didn't make a team. And rather than everybody being like, that's weird, don't say anything. Mm -hmm. It could be like, hey, who wants to do something on Friday night? Because then Benjamin doesn't feel like he's now, you know what I mean? So I feel like as parents, we can, if, if yeah. we're talking to each other and we're communicating with each other, and we know those things are happening, we have a small enough community, we have the ability to be like, Let's circle the wagons on that and not make it a problem and not allow for it to become a problem. That's a great idea. Um. Good. And I would just add, this is one of the reasons on the school end why we're so strict about having videos, uh, devices that can live stream and things like that out during the school day. And, um, you know, especially at the middle school level, it drives people, um, it drives students crazy. Um, but but so that when, you know, castless and things like that are going up, there's not an opportunity to um, send that out. But that's a school space that we can control. And so that's, you know, not the same as when they're, they're out in other places, but hopefully it starts to set the standard that, hey, this isn't a thing that we need to live stream. Do you guys see a direct relation with some kiddos that maybe are having some more emotional challenges that you are aware of and maybe have phones or acts or maybe like our gamers or what? Do you see that as, do you see those individuals having more challenges with things or? Less so with, and feel free to wait, less so with video games, um, but I mean, I think it's hard to, this is, kind of turns into a chicken or the egg conversation, because certainly students that are struggling, we see retreat into technology. Um, and then conversely, there are students whose struggles are really, really amplified by the way that they're engaging with technology. And so the short answer is yes, but I can also think of some really great examples where either, either it was parent-led or it was student-led, where a student was having a rough time socially and intentionally took a technology break, and it was awesome. Um, and like I said, I've seen that student-led and parent-led. Just, hey, we're gonna put this down for the weekend. And I, and I will tell you, and I, know, I apologize, because so much of this is geared at, at older kids, but I will tell you, in the moment, it makes the student lose their mind <laughs> because not having access to all of your people can feel like losing a limb, you know? But what I have seen time after time, this is anecdotal, I'm not a social scientist, but that it ends up working out really well, even if the pushback in the moment is hard. Can you comment just on my third grader, so we're kind of not in that place yet, but um, just leading toward that, is what is the school doing for something we need to know um, to be more off for a way to late and sure. work on that, um, on board with that, but what, what is the school doing or what pieces are in place for your the middle age group or middle school group mm -hmm. when you see a problem or preventing problems, and I love that, that example of just like you don't allow the live stream and stuff like that. Sure. What else? Yeah. Part of do, do we have to look forward to that support? Yeah, absolutely. There's a couple of ways that work. That works. So one is just um, limiting the types of devices that can be on campus or used in classrooms, and that's with cell phones. Um, students get iPads. You know, we switched to one-to-one -one during COVID, and so students have access to iPads early. Um, they don't have access to email with each other until middle school because that is another way that they can communicate, and that is for sure another way that mean things can happen. Um, we have access on the back end to all of the information that they share back and forth. Um, they're aware of that. We talk frequently about the fact that school devices are school devices and nothing is private on school devices. Um, uh, and then there are also educational pieces in place, like the Social Institute that starts in fifth grade where they start talking about what does it look like to navigate a digital space, whether it's your own personal social media account or interacting with you know AI, understanding how your um, digital footprint online can open you up to, you know, Invasions of privacy 
or being misrepresented in ways that you don't think about when you're 10 and on Roblox or whatever, you know. Um, and then additionally, once they get into middle school, it's a lot of, of um, conversations around social interactions. And that was something that we um, took a close look at over the last summer, recognizing that these digital spaces are, are kind of, and I'm, I don't, I don't want to speak too strong because again I get out over my skis, but really we feel like leading to a breakdown in the way that they interact with each other in person when there's conflict. So a lot of that also is when conflict emerges, when we see, you know, hear about students being mean to each other online or misusing technology, it's pulling students together to walk through a conversation. And we use tools from, for example, Ruler, our social emotional learning program, to scaffold what that conversation needs to look like, but really trying to take a lot of those social conversations offline and into a real space because that's another thing too that they miss you know when you say kill yourself via text they're not picturing their friend doing harm to themselves they're just throwing something out into the ether you know but to stand in front of someone and make eye contact um, it's a really different experience for them so on the mental health side of that um, some of us are looped in I say the kid searches something or has some things that are you know, not appropriate, and they don't realize that, we'll get a notification about that too, so we can check in on a child as well, but hey, like, is this a research project, like, you know, everything okay? Like, what's going on with this? I, I saw this. Um, and so, well, I don't know if that helps, but like, that's another additional piece on the mental health side that like, adds to how we monitor things as well. To add to that, with, uh, with an eighth grader and kids kind of down the lower grade, um, we see, to your, to, to kind of plug you a little bit, She's done an amazing job of leading this middle school in creating all of the things just that she just mentioned, but also like teachers around these kids who are paying attention. And if something's not going right, they're aware of it. And I just think communication is so good and so positive that these kids know that they have people around them. So I just think that's really hard to replicate at any other school. Yeah, we're, I appreciate that. We're lucky to have the team that we do because there's a lot of eyes on your kids, much to their dismay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really parents, too. It's one of the reasons why I think it makes such a difference. With us texting each other when something happens with our boys and knowing, like, you know, they're going to get the same message at their house, in their car, whatever it is. It's just really powerful at the beach. Um, I'm going to move on to the second video. It's 20 minutes. Let's see, we're at 12.35. You have to leave, I get it. Um, it's a really good video. Uh, and then let's see if we can get a little discussion around that to wrap up. I'm, I'm not going to pause it. It's pausing. I'm just going to breeze past that if that's okay with everyone. Is that okay? Yeah. organization Screen Sanity. As a mom who's looking for a little screen sanity in my own home. We are the first generation of parents to raise digital natives, kids who'd rather text than talk. And it's hard. Surveys show that technology is the number one battleground in homes today. We feel pressure to make tough decisions like when should I give my kid a phone or how should I approach social media? How do I keep them safe online? As screens have seeped into every corner of our kids' lives, many of us are trying to navigate this unpaved road alone. There is such strength in numbers, and we're so glad that you're here. Here's the good news. Whether you feel like it or not, you have what it takes to be a mentor and guide to your child, even in the digital world. This won't be through the tap of an easy button, or a list of apps to avoid, or a magical number of screen time minutes. Because like most parts of parenting, it's more complicated than that. Instead, we invite you to think of their childhood and teenage years as an opportunity to grow muscles they will need to become healthy, safe tech users for the rest of their lives. At Screen Sanity, we have all kinds of resources to help you grow those muscles. But today, we want to give you a taste of our resources by offering you our top five recommendations for what we call digital health. 
Just like we think about our physical and mental health, we want to help you think about how to maximize the incredible benefits of technology while minimizing the side effects. The topic can feel overwhelming, but we're not going to give you a long list of things you must do. Instead, we're going to share some ideas of places to start. In fact, to keep it simple, we'll use that acronym, START. The first area is start with yourself, then tables and bedtimes, accountability, right practice drive, and time well spent. It probably sounds like a lot, but keep in mind that these ideas are not a one-size-fits-all answer. Each family is unique. So just focus in on the actions that feel doable to you. We want you to walk away with a game plan that feels right for your family. Ready? Our first rule of thumb is start with yourself. Studies show that we look at our phones more than 80 times a day, which makes sense. Today's parents have a lot on our plates. We invited our friend Will to give us a peek into how he was managing all the balls he's been juggling lately. Oh, it's so nice to all be sitting down together. Who can tell me something they did today? Um, I drew a horsey. Good for you, son. <laughs> I started smoking. Oh, I love you too, sweetheart. I'm selling bongs out of our minivan. I got a tramp stamp. I'm getting implants. I'm dating your brother. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm cooking meth in the basement. <laughs> Great idea, kiddo. That's why you're so popular at school. <laughs> this family is picking up on a phenomenon known as bubby. It's a word that means snubbing someone you're with to look at your phone. Ironically, bubbing happens because you are trying to stay connected, but it actually disrupts your attention to the person right in front of you. Unfortunately, this distraction can accidentally send painful messages to our kids. Recently, we had the honor of being involved in a campaign to raise awareness about teenage mental health and suicide. At one of the meetings, high school students were asked, what is the number one thing parents can do for kids' mental health? Their answer, put your phones down and talk to us. One of the best ways to adopt healthy habits is to insert different types of friction into your daily routine so that it's a little harder for you to be mindless by your screen time. For example, one tiny tweak that can make a huge impact is turning off notifications. Those tempting little dings that invite us to take just one little peek, unless they're from a real person, like texts or calls. Another trick we found helpful to manage this even further is to wear a smartwatch. You can use it as a tool to filter out notifications from everyone except the few people who need to get through to you, like spouses, caregivers, and the school nurse. Finally, you could consider deleting certain apps from your phone. Social media apps in particular are designed to steal our attention and increase the amount of time we spend on our devices. Consider deleting the apps. You can actually still access Instagram, Facebook, and other sites through the internet browser on your phone, but not having the app makes it just a little bit harder. So you won't be as tempted to check it every time you pick up your phone. through the screen, right? The struggle is real, and these battles are often activated when you ask your child to turn their screen off or put them down. But just like we encourage our kids to choose healthy foods over sugary treats, we want our kids to get in the healthy habit of being able to go device-free. One of the best ways to build these muscles is to have predictable, consistent times and places where your family practices unplugging. Your kids might resist this idea at first, but once they know the routine, they will be less likely to resist and more likely to even look forward to that time. Here's a closer look at a couple device-free zones to consider, tables and bedtimes. Just like our devices, our kids need to recharge. The more they settle into the habit of unplugging regularly, the healthier they will be. 
If you're looking for a place to designate as device-free zones, we suggest tables and bedtimes. First, tables. Research demonstrates family dinners have remarkable benefits. These benefits are not dependent upon an organic gourmet meal, but they are dependent upon focused time. If family members are distracted by their devices or TV, it typically interferes with building family relationships. But if you put those devices away for 30 minutes, it may provide small opportunities to connect. Consider using dinner to check in, maybe highs, lows, and buffaloes. One high point from the day, one low, and one thing totally random or interesting. These small moments can help create stronger connections away from the table. And what about at the end of the day? Many kids have their devices in their bedroom overnight, and it often starts because they need an alarm clock or music to help them sleep. It makes sense that they got in there, but for any of you with kids old enough to have their own devices, we suggest removing devices from kids' bedrooms overnight. Research shows that nearly 80% of kids are using their devices when they're supposed to be sleeping, with many waking up throughout the night for every notification, even if they are doing something innocent like watching cat videos. This is tough on them because sleep is a critical factor of mental and physical health. And what's more, we've heard from many counselors and police officers that our impulse control is lower at night, and kids are likely to make some of the worst decisions at that time. childhoods, many of us have memories of playing hard on a schoolyard jungle gym. But today's kids spend a lot of time in a new kind of playground, the online world. Unfortunately, it's the kind of playground that isn't just for kids, doesn't have a gate around it to protect it, or a recess teacher to supervise. While the internet gives kids many powerful opportunities to explore, create, and connect, it can also be filled with bullies at best and predators at worst. And unlike the school playground, these bullies can't be left behind. They have access to our kids 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In short, there are many reasons it's a good idea to keep an eye on the places your child has been in the online world and put boundaries around where they can go. Because even though they're under your own roof, accidents can still happen. Let's hear more. A recent study revealed that 94% of teenagers ask the internet for advice before they ask a parent. Unfortunately, we hear stories about this a lot. A child might overhear a word at the lunch table that they don't recognize, and just like they would Google an insect species for science class, they Google the word and accidentally stumble into a world of pornography. And today's pornography? It makes the Playboy, Hustler, and Penthouse magazines of the past seem well, quaint. Modern pornography is hardcore by definition, with 94% of the scenes portraying men being physically violent towards women. One of our biggest recommendations is to make sure that your child is using a device that is protected by an internet filter. While some parents share that they feel filters communicate a lack of trust for their kids, we encourage you to think of it like putting on a seatbelt when you ride in the car. You do it because accidents happen. So, to keep your kids as safe as possible, we encourage you to think in layers. Your base layer is installing an internet filter. This is a product you apply at the router level, and it keeps hardcore content out of your child's Google searches. This will take a little time investment on your part. So maybe set aside a couple of hours on a weekend when you plan to go through the steps of installing these on each of your family's personal laptops and smartphones. As for school-provided devices, Many come with protective filters, but check in with your school to make sure that their coverage extends beyond the school's Wi-Fi range and covers the device at home. Then, you might want to layer on a social media monitoring app like Bark, which scans their social media and text feeds, alerting you when there is harmful content. As far as streaming goes, 
Depending on the age of your child, you may want to consider more gated sources like PBS Kids, Disney Plus, Netflix, rather than less managed sites like YouTube or TikTok. No matter which corner of the digital map your child is exploring, it's helpful if you know the passwords to your child's account. And whenever possible, avoid allowing them to use devices in private places like bedrooms or bathrooms where it's easier to make bad choices. And one more thing, even with safety nets in place, be warned that mistakes will happen. So when your child shares or you uncover an awkward or shocking situation, it's best if you practice your poker face. This is hard, but it's critical that you don't overreact. Make it clear to your child that you are safe harbor and they can tell you anything, even if you later need to run to the closet to scream into a pillow. The more calmly you respond, the more likely your child will be to come to you the next time they need your help. We can't overemphasize the value of getting ahead by talking about online hazards proactively. And yet, conversations about things like pornography and sexting are flat out awkward. So I wanna leave you with a couple ideas. To start a conversation about pornography with your child, we strongly recommend the book, Good Pictures, Bad Pictures. We have found it to be a gentle, effective resource to help you start discussions about pornography, introducing it in a safe, clear way. There's even a junior version for kids as young as three to six. However awkward these conversations might feel to you, chances are your child will likely feel loved that you're willing to walk beside them through uncomfortable situations. And they will know that you are a trustworthy guide as they encounter hazardous situations in the digital world. While there are no guarantees, this next rule of thumb highlights something you can do to give your kid a serious advantage when it comes to safely navigating the hazards of the online world. When it's time to introduce them to new technology like smartphones or social media apps, take a driver's ed approach. We call this rule of thumb, ride, practice, drive. Let's take a look. We use three words to guide our device introduction process. Ride practice drive. Because teaching a kid to drive a smartphone, and it's kind of like teaching a kid to drive a car. Think about it. When you teach your kids to drive, you don't simply hand them the keys and wish them luck. The car is a powerful machine that could crush them if they didn't know what they were doing. So instead, you prepare them to navigate risky situations and road hazards. You put them through driver's ed, which is an intentional process that starts with limited freedom and grow slowly as students demonstrate confidence. Eventually, kids learn to be independent and self-regulated drivers. We're convinced that a similar approach could be taken with smartphones. When it's time for a device, consider starting with a device that is simple and limited. Maybe try a walkie-talkie first before you move on to a watch or a first phone. These types of tech products allow kids to experiment with independence and allow kids to develop conversation and eye contact skills, which boost their social emotional development. As they prove that they have mastered one digital driving skill, you trust them to try out an even harder one. Eventually, you will feel confident that they are ready to try out a smartphone stripped down to limit its features. But be aware that when you do so, you should plan to log many hours riding in the passenger seat, helping them practice digital skills. You might start practicing texting with a handful of loved ones before advancing on to group texting, which can be like an onion, layer after layer of potential challenges. No doubt, there are many of you watching along who are in the thick of it. Your child has a smartphone and you know firsthand how exhausting it can be to ride along as your child hits potholes and makes mistakes. But take heart, the fact that you are tuned in to this session means you are probably doing a better job than you think. Just know 
The time in the passenger seat won't last forever. You are heading somewhere with this training process. Smartphone independence. Sure, they will still bump curbs or get in accidents, but hopefully they can mostly navigate sticky situations on their own. Maybe with an occasional call home for advice. Well, we found this analogy to be really helpful to apply in seasons of smartphone introduction. We often hear from parents who share that they're hungry for practical suggestions about devices we recommend along the way. Great news. The kid-friendly device market is beginning to explode with options for smartwatches and phones, and we love telling parents about our favorite products. We are regularly sharing on our website, newsletter, and social media feeds about products that we have found can really be great training wheels for the pre-smartphone years. If you haven't yet, visit our website to join our newsletter list. includes connecting with your kids in ways that are meaningful. But it doesn't have to be serious. At the dinner table, plan a stack of table topics cards to help spark funny conversations. Or maybe carve a time out once a week to start playing a new sport together. We also have to be intentional about how we pursue their hearts in the online world. Learning to live in harmony with technology can be hard. It is one of the most forward-thinking actions you can take as a parent in the digital age. The key is, Screen time really falls into three buckets. Times you create, times when you connect, and times when you just consume. A good rule of thumb is to choose screen time that helps you create and connect rather than consume. So apps that helps kids write books, make time-lapse videos, or design buildings. This helps build and grow different parts of their brains, as opposed to going down a rabbit hole of TikTok binging, for example. This isn't 100%, like, it's not foolproof. Sometimes as a parent, you all know this. Every one of you knows how hard it can be. Um, and for us, that's a challenge. And so we try to create a different experience for them. So just kind of molding into how it works for your family. What are your guys' thoughts on any other part of the video? Um, one of the other things that I seem to have connected with, with kids, um, kids are really cool in the sense of like the content that they create either on YouTube, uh, on YouTube or gaming systems. Um, and I think some of the biggest connections that I've made with kids is them showing me something that they're passionate about. Hey, we do a one-on-one -on -one session. I heard that you, you know, you told me last time that you have a YouTube channel. Like, what do you do on that? And here, let's just bring it up. Show me what you do on it. And going through and having the kid do that with you and show you what they're doing just seems to open them up completely, to, to me at least. And so I can't imagine what that would look like as a parent. Um, you know, if a male cre creates something, like, I'm gonna sit down, give you the full attention, like, show me what you created, show me what you liked. Um, I know a lot of our kids play video games also in that sense, so you take me through Roblox. Now you also have an idea 
hey, what's the content look like? Who can they chat with? Um, they don't know that you might, you're looking for this stuff, but like that's just other ways to get into their life and also see what they're doing. Um, so I kind of like that part about it as well. What do you have, Ms. Hood? Oh, yeah. I have a question. As you um, um, study this curriculum, do they have a spinoff and training and videos that are directed to kids? Because one thing I, I worry about is, you know, yes, our kids here, like, look, you're not getting a phone. It's not happening. Like, you, you, there's no plan for this anytime soon. And I don't know that we do a good job of, like, really explaining to them why. Like, they may hear some trickles and some bits about what we're afraid of, but is that part, is there any curriculum like this that's to the kids in terms of what, what what's out there, cyberbullying, what, why we're so worried about this? And so for me, so I, I'm not sure if there's, I'm sure there is something out there for the school what, right. that deals with yeah. that in a sense of um, having lessons starting at that fifth grade level on like what that looks like, but in a more natural way, so we're not calling it deadly cyberbullying um, or just meanness or any kind of other bullying. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's helping the kids like navigate that through a healthier way. So I think we are doing that. I don't know. I don't know if Screen Sanity has something like that. Yeah, Screen Sanity is primarily focused on facilitating conversations between parent and child, and then also other parents. And so it offers both of those. It's not geared exclusively to the student. That's more Social Institute that we do on campus. Screen Sanity is absolutely about facilitating conversation and has those talking points, and even has parts of the study guide that a student might reflect on on their own. Um, but it's not a standalone curriculum for students, if that makes sense. I appreciate you guys being here a ton. I know we're running a little bit close to time on their website, which I love, which also, by the way, the, the parents, all you guys have access to the Social Institute as well. There's a parent access code that comes with every counselor's newsletter at the bottom. Um, you have access to all the material that they have there. And in that, they're always updating what apps um, are out there, stuff that I've never heard of, um, but that our kids are using, the, good, the, the pros, the cons, and how you can best utilize um, the app. But, with Screen Sanity, they do an awesome job too because they have like a booklet here, which I left out there. Um, this is just for TikTok, a whole booklet about how you can navigate TikTok, the benefits, the dangers of TikToks, and they did a whole like pamphlet on it. They have so many apps on their website with pamphlets just like this. Um, so I would really encourage you guys to check out their website. Um, appreciate it again very much. I hope this content was in, uh, you know applicable to you guys and helpful. Um, our next Lunch and Learn is coming up in April. Um, and if there's anything in between, if you guys need any more material, questions, there's lots of process there. Please feel free to reject myself or Lucy. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.